Yeah, so thank you very much for the introduction and thanks to the organizers for, uh, well, for inviting me to be here uh, celebrating Richard's uh, birthday. It's a great week and, uh, and uh, thanks also for invi inviting me to give a talk. So, um, so in fact, I, uh, this talk is a bit from the, say, fringes of uh, Richard's mathematical world. Uh, uh, so, so the talk is going to be about uh, uh, some constructions of uh, complete non-compact Riemannian manifolds that are Ricci flat uh, with some sort of interesting asymptotic geometry. Uh, Richard himself and many of his uh, collaborators and descendants have been and are working on uh, sort of understanding the geometry of uh, complete non-compact manifolds with interesting asymptotic geometry. So this often goes through finding appropriate compactifications. So in this talk, actually, the asymptotic geometry is very simple. Uh, it's uh, probably the simplest version of a fiber boundary metric. And I guess the main compute contribution it's more on the geometry side is going to be kind of how to construct examples of uh, such manifolds in a context where a priori is not so obvious at all how you would go about constructing constructing this these metrics so uh, so let me start giving giving a, a sort of precise definition of what this ALC asymptotic geometry is so ALC stands for asymptotically locally conical uh, and it's a acronym that was introduced in the physics literature. Uh, <coughs> so it's really the simplest, uh, the simplest type of a uh, fiber boundary metric. So here we have a compact, closed, connected manifold, uh, n minus two dimensional. Uh, R is some radial coordinate, and we have a principal circle bundle over sigma. So there's some smooth manifold with a free circle action with quotient sigma. Uh, theta is a connection on this bundle. So it's a one form on n that is S1 invariant and uh, evaluates to one on the vector field that generate the S1 action. M is a positive is constant. And this is really the model metric that, uh, that we write on this product, r plus times, times n. Uh, so if you change coordinates r equal 1 over x, then uh, uh, R going to infinity corresponds to x equals 0. And this is a fiber boundary metric, very special. The fibers are simply circles. And moreover, the metric restricted on the circles is just constant. It's, uh, uh, you can be slightly bit more general and uh, sort of destroy the circle action by quotienting uh, with an appropriate involution. Uh, so you can consider an involution that uh, uh, sort of on the circle fibers act as a complex conjugation, if you think of your circle embedded inside C as the unit circle. Okay, so, so, so and then uh, an ALC manifold is going to be a complete non-compact manifold for simplicity. And since I'm going to talk about uh, Ricci flat manifolds, we just look complete non-compact manifolds with only one end. And let's say that is ALC of cyclic of, or the hedral type if uh, the following is true. So you remove a compact set and you identify the complement with an exterior region inside this model space. Uh, so if you really have a diffeomorphism, then you're going to say that you are in the cyclic case. If instead you have to pass the double cover, was group of that transformation is generated by an involution iota as a board. Uh, uh, up there, uh, then I'm going to say that we are, we are in the dihedral case. But in each case, anyway, you choose this f. And then in this uh, special distinguished sort of coordinates at infinity, uh, your metric looks like the model up to some polynomial decaying terms with all derivatives. OK, so, for, so just a very simple example. Just take the Schwarzschild metric, make it U, U, Euclidean, then, uh, then that this would be an example of or something like this, but in that case, very special. You would have sort of this cone over sigma, the tangent cone at infinity of this matrix, 
would be simply R3, so it would be flat. And uh, so there, in the physics literature, people would talk of an ALF metric, asymptotically locally flat. So this ALC, sort of the same as ALF metric, but now the tangent cone at infinity is not restricted to be flat. It's an arbitrary cone. OK, so, so the reason, so OK, so, so what uh, the talk is going to be about, some examples of uh, Ricci flat uh, ALC manifolds, but in fact, I'll be talking about uh, Ricci flat manifolds that are, uh, arise from some uh, reduction of their holonomy groups. So, um, so in practice, as we will see, what, what this means is that there's going to be uh, some uh, system of first order partial differential equations, often related to sort of um, differential forms, and satisfying this first order system as a consequent would imply that the metric is Ricci flat. So, uh, some first order system then imply the second order Einstein equations. And uh, perhaps here I sort of well, kind of recall that uh, sort of if you look at uh, uh, compact, uh, simply connected Ricci flat manifolds, then the only examples that we know so far, they're all actually come from some uh, holonomy reduction. So, so that's, that's not true in the non compact setting, but I think. All the complete non compact Ricci flat manifolds that I know that don't have special autonomy actually arise from some symmetry construction, I believe. Uh, so, um, uh, so, the motivation for looking at this particular asymptotic geometry on my side is uh, that uh, sort of we're interested in uh, trying to understand what happens to. Uh, manifolds, compact manifolds with special holonomy as they uh, sort of undergo codimension one collapse. So you look at sequences of n dimensional compact n dimensional manifolds that Gromov Hausdorff converge to a n minus one dimensional limit. And sort of this ALC geometry you could imagine as sort of providing some sort of uh, non compact model for this behavior. So, in the most obvious way, you could, for example, Imagine that some ALC space are going to appear as bubbles or rescale limits. And when you look at, for example, sequences of uh, <laughs> compact manifolds that are collapsing down to something that has isolated conical singularities, then, then some ALC like this is going, is going to appear. OK, so, so if you think about sort of uh, uh, things from this point of view of collapse, there's sort of two kind of competing principles, I guess, that you lead to. Uh, consider. Um, so one, one is the fact that, OK, so when we look at this collapse, then we imagine that uh, uh, in some large regions, then uh, during the collapsing process, curvature is going to remain bounded. And then the general theory of collapse with bounded curvature, developed by Chigar, Fukai, and Gromov in the 80s, is going to tell you that what should really be looking is metric with a circle symmetries, at least a leading order. So, so in fact, in the first part of the talk, I'm going to talk about construction of circle invariant uh, ALC metrics. But on the other hand, if you sort of really interested in trying to think about compact manifolds, then you also know that compact rich flat manifolds do not have uh, non-parallel killing fields. So you need some mechanism to sort of break this S1 symmetry. And this is really provided by these dihedral ALC spaces. So, um, so in fact, in, in various cases, one can prove and more generally expect that for ALC spaces of cyclic type, so there's this circle action at infinity, this will actually extend uh, to, the whole, to the whole manifold. And in the dihedral case, really, there's not even a circle action at infinity. So that's the sort of mechanism to to break the symmetry. So the second part of the talk is got the focus is going to be try to construct uh, at least one uh, ALC space of the hydro type in some higher dimensions. OK, but let me start with a, a sort of a situation for dimensional case where actually uh, essentially almost everything is known. So that's the case of hyperkeller uh, uh, hyper metrics in dimension four. Um, uh, so, so hyperkeller means, I mean, uh, there's a triple of two forms. Um, 
And uh, so this, these two forms satisfy a certain kind of pointwise constraint. Uh, let say, so essentially you wedge, wedge two of them together, then you want that this is a, uh, up to a constant volume form is the identity three by three matrix, and then these forms are all closed. So, so you have the first order PD looks linear, but this is some nonlinear constraints that you that you impose on this on this on these two forms. And uh, uh, so here up there, there's the uh, most general uh, four-dimensional complete. Uh, hyperkähler metric with a circle symmetry and finite L2 norm of curvature. So, uh, so, so, so this was, a, I mean, it was understood by Gibbons and Hawking in the late 70s that uh, hyperkähler metrics uh, with a circle symmetry are actually very easy to write locally. You just have to find a harmonic function on an open, positive harmonic function on an open set in R3. So here one has uh, n distinct points in R3. And here in parentheses, this is the most general positive harmonic uh, for, uh, function on uh, R3, uh, on the complement of this finite number of points in R3. OK, so the, 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 so x are uh, Euclidean coordinates on R3. The four manifold itself, outside of finitely many points, is a circle bundle over, over this punctured R3. Uh, so theta is a connection one form on this uh, on this circle bundle, and uh, sort of the curvature of this connection is determined by the harmonic function. By so you take the differential, and uh, you get a one form on R three, and then you you dodge dual to get a two form. Okay, since since the function is harmonic, this is closed. Uh, the right weights that you're choosing here for the Green's function singularity say that this is an integral class, so there's going to be a circle bundle. OK, so m, m here must be a non-negative constant. If we take m strictly positive, then uh, we clearly have some uh, uh, ALF, ALC geometry, where the tangent cone at infinity is R3. So uh, sort of the circle fibers at infinity, they have length uh, 2 pi over square root of m. Okay. Okay, that's good. So this this gives uh, sort of the the essentially all uh, ALF hyperkähler metrics of cyclic type, and constructing ones of the hydral type is quite a bit more involved. There's actually uh, lots of different uh, constructions, and uh, knowing that actually all these constructions give the same example is only a recent uh, uh, achievement. Uh, so I'm not sure whether Michael is going to describe tomorrow a way of constructing. Okay. Uh, I'll construct the dihedral one. So I want to describe here actually a different way of getting them that's going to be more relevant for, for us today. Uh, so this way of constructing ALF metric of dihedral type. So again, they're absolutely crucial to have them if we want to think about compact examples. Um, and, uh, but it's a bit of a detour. So, so the detour is to start thinking about what happens to this family of ALF metric as uh, sort of the circle at infinity is growing in size? Okay, so, so in, this, in this parametrization, this means try to look at limits as m goes to 0. And well, here we can just take the limit m equals 0. We get a perfectly nice positive harmonic function, so a perfectly nice hyperkähler metric on the same manifolds. But now the asymptotic geometry is completely different. This is going to be in the limit m equals 0 and ALE uh, metric uh, asymptotic and infinity to R4 mod Zn. Okay, so so there's a slightly uh, sort of different way of thinking about this limit, where you sort of I mean after all we're constructing Ricci flat metrics, so you can always res rescaling preserve the equations. So when we look at this sequence of uh, ALF metric where the circle at infinity is growing, we can rescale them down so that the circle size at infinity is fixed. But now something bad is happening in the interior. Uh, so by simple rescaling, you just get all the points sort of coalescing into the origin. And this other sort of different way of thinking about the limit m equals 0, in the limit you get some ALF geometry, <coughs> perfectly nice at infinity. But in the interior, there's an orbifold singularity. And in fact, uh, 
so essentially you put just m equal one and then uh, uh, multiplicity and point at the origin. <coughs> so that's actually just a Zn quotient of a smooth metric. So, so if here you have m equal one and just one point, get a smooth metric on R4, that's called the tau knot metric. Uh, if you put m mul multiplicity n at the origin, you just get an orbifold of, of this tau knot metric. OK, and sort of these two ways of thinking about this limit m equals 0 are sort of complementary in the sense that <coughs> sort of the uh, tangent cone at the singularity of the orbifold matches exactly the uh, tangent cone at infinity of the ALE space. So you can imagine sort of doing a gluing and reconstruct your smooth ALF spaces. This is, of course, ridiculous in this uh, case because here's the explicit solution. Uh, but uh, <coughs> this is useful. Uh, to construct the hydral ALF spaces. So this was done by Olivier Bicard and Vincent Miner. So essentially, when you look at the isometry group of tau knot, that knot does not only contain cyclic group, Zn, but it also contains binary dihedral groups that sort of, at infinity, have this property of sort of the um, uh, Z2 quotient of uh, the binary dihedral group acts at infinity precisely sort of as this standard involution that complex conjugation of the circle fibers at infinity. So you can take these other or before quotients. Uh, there are ALE metrics, hyperkalem metrics, that are <coughs> asymptotic to those singularities. That's constructed by Kronheimer in the late 80s. And you can do this gluing and construct uh, dihedral ALS spaces this way. OK, so and the <coughs> story in this four-dimensional case is complete in the sense that we have classifications of uh, uh, these ALF manifolds. Uh, uh, so in the cyclic case, this was done by Minerp. And in the dihedral case, that's a res very recent result of Gao Chen and Xu Shun Chen. OK, so, <coughs> so what, what I want to try to do is sort of describe a similar story in higher dimensions for uh, special holonomy in higher dimensions. And okay, so if you start going to higher dimensions, then almost all special holonomy groups related to Ricci flatness, they're all sort of are related to some underlying Keller uh, geometry. Okay? So uh, on the other hand, sort of Keller geometry and ALC asymptotic geometry don't quite go well hand in hand. And the, the sort of reason, so heuristic reason is this. So, so if you go, so if you think at this model metric, then you have this circle option, perhaps up to a, a double cover. And so you have this uh, essentially almost parallel uh, uh, vector field, uh, killing field at infinity, where essentially the vector field that generates the s action is covariant derivative decays like um, uh, r minus 2. And uh, <coughs> so if you have now have a parallel complex structure, you get another direction that's almost parallel at infinity. So what it's saying is that you should be looking at a tangent cone at infinity that splits off a line. And then uh, if you insist that the tangent cone at infinity is smooth, then this would mean that your tangent cone at infinity is just flat, then, then maybe there's not so much flexibility. So if you start, if you start thinking about uh, Keller and ALC, then I mean Keller and sort of geometries like this, then probably you should start thinking about something more, bit more well, quite a bit more complicated, like I don't know, something that one could talk about, maybe QLC, something like that. But, if we want to stay uh, in this ALC geometry, then maybe we should look for situations where we don't have some Keller geometry. And there's two <coughs> exceptional uh, cases where that happens. So this is a spin 7 matrix in dimension 8 and G2 matrix in dimension 7. So that's what are, where I'm going to focus, what I'm going to focus on. And the moral is that the story is actually qualitatively quite similar to this four dimensional story. OK, so, so first part, I want to describe sort of uh, analog of this Gibbons-Hawking construction. Uh, so some of you have heard me talking about that, but that's really the starting point. Um, so and I'm trying to explain this in this spin 7 setting. So we start with a eight-dimensional metric uh, with holonomy spin 7. <coughs> what this means is that there's a, a differential four form that has some special algebraic pointwise algebraic property. I'll say that is an admissible four form. 
and we want phi, capital Phi to be closed. Okay, so, so now we look at spin seven metrics that are circle invariant. So we work on a manifold that is a principal circle bundle over a seven dimensional base that's smooth. The four form capital Phi takes this special form where, so here, let's see. So theta is a connection one form on the circle bundle. H is a positive function. Uh, little phi is a three form on the seven manifold uh, that has some special pointwise algebraic properties. So these special algebraic properties imply that actually phi by itself determines a Riemannian metric on B that I'll denote by G phi. And then this psi is a four form that is actually just the Hodge dual of phi with respect to the metric that it defines. And here G is this eight dimensional metric written in terms of this metric G phi and the connection one form and the function H. Okay, and then we have this condition as phi close and these are the equations, the sort of dimensionally reduced equations that you get that should be the analog of this Gibbons Hawking ansatz. And what's clear is that uh, that's nothing as having a harmonic function on R3. So, so, so in this higher dimensional setting, when you dimensionally reduce, you still get some nonlinear PDEs. And there's really, I mean, I essentially have nothing to say in general about solutions to these equations, except perhaps that there's a topological uh, uh, necessary condition. So d theta, uh, so theta curvature on the bundle, so d theta in cohomology represents the first gen class of this bundle. Phi by the first equation is closed, so there's a cohomology class, and this equation is saying that their cup product in particular must vanish in cohomology. But then apart from this, it's really, I can't say anything. Uh, so the idea would be to try to deform this equation to something that we understand, and there's a very natural geometric way of deforming here, where you imagine circles uh, sort of shrink into zero size. Okay, so you sort of try to do some adiabatic limit study of these equations. You introduce a small parameter epsilon, to sort of control in the size of the circle fibers, and you get some epsilon dependent family of equations that, uh, uh, and you sort of try to study, well, first of all, you try to take a formal limits of these equations, and with a bit of manipulation in the, in the limit, epsilon equals zero, you find that the function must be a constant. You can normalize to be one. And then the limiting three form phi not is actually closed and co-closed with respect to the metric that it defines. So we started from some first order system in eight dimension and in the limit, in this uh, sort of epsilon equals zero limit, you obtain a first order system in seven dimensions. And that's exactly the first order system that corresponds to this G2. Uh, holonomy metrics. So we're sort of connecting uh, special holonomy geometries in different dimensions via this uh, adiabatic limit. And then this, then the potential strategy to solve this equation would be, okay, let's start with a solution of the limiting equations and uh, try to, uh, um, by implicit function theorem, construct solutions for epsilon small but positive. Okay, and uh, sort of this works um, in uh, uh, a particular setting where you try to construct ALC metrics. So if you're starting to, if you try to construct ALC metrics, you want to start from some asymptotically conical, uh, so scattering lower dimensional space and construct an extra dimension on a circle bundle. Uh, so here we start from an asymptotically conical G2 metric and we get uh, one parameter family of highly collapsed spin seven metrics on a suitable circle bundle. Satisfied the topological constraint. And, but what I, what I want to emphasize here is that uh, one has to be a little bit more general and uh, to, to get a, a useful theorem here. So the point is that there's essentially a very few asymptotically conical G2 manifold no, known, but there's plenty of asymptotically conical G2 orbifolds. So here, really, what you want to do is start with an asymptotically conical orbifold that emits a circle orbit bundle with total space is a smooth manifold, so some sort of ciphered, uh, ciphered circle vibration, and construct a metric that, I don't know, maybe one should call foliated ALC, I don't know, some example of a maybe foliated uh, boundary matrix or something. Okay, so, uh, so how do you prove this? Well, <coughs> I mean, it's a sort of iteration scheme. 
uh, uh, one has to, so the key thing is understanding linearization of those uh, sort of Gibbons Hawking type equations in dimension eight for spin, spin seven metrics. So those equations are not obviously elliptic for various reasons. There's quite a lot of massaging one has to do to connect to things, a system that actually involves Dirac operators and D plus D star, but that can be done. And then one needs to say something about how, how to work on these asymptotic conical orbifolds. Um, so, uh, uh, so here you really, I mean, to have a useful theorem, you really need orbifold singularities that go all the way to infinity. And I don't think, I mean, at least I, I'm not sure whether there was anything off the shelf that I could quote. So, so but here is actually very, very uh, sort of the, the geometric problem is already tells you what the, the solution is. You just work S1 equivariantly on the smooth eight manifold. Uh, so you work on the eight manifold with basic differential forms. Uh, perhaps instead of using levi schiavo connection, you want to use some adapter connection that behaves better with respect to the composition to vertical and horizontal. And since we're solving linear equations to solve a nonlinear system, you need uh, the appropriate sort of Sobolev embedding uh, theorems. Okay, so, 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 but this, this essentially, once you set up the framework, then the analysis on scattering manifolds goes through uh, exactly the same way on this set. Okay, and as I was saying, this is uh, sort of a useful theorem. Uh, I mean, there's very, a handful of complete spin seven, uh, non-compact spin seven metrics known before this, and this can be used to produce infinitely many different diffeomorphism types, di infinitely many distinct families on the same smooth manifolds. And, um, and, and again, I mean, it's also probably, okay, special holonomy, but even within the larger realm of uh, Ricci flat manifolds, I'm not sure whether there's ve that many, I think there's not, I mean, that's probably one of the first constructions of uh, analytic constructions of Ricci, complete Ricci flat metrics that are not Keller. Um, but anyway. Um, okay, so, uh, so there's an analogous theorem uh, in sort of one dimension less. Uh, so we want to construct LC G2 metrics. So these I proved uh, two years ago with uh, Mark Haskins and Johannes Nostrom. So again, you have some LC G2 metric on a circle bundle over something six dimensional now and the relevant geometric in six dimension is the geometry of uh, asymptotic conical Calabi-L metrics. Uh, so in this case, you don't need to go through orbifolds uh, because there's already loads of asymptotic conical Calabi L3 folds constructed <coughs> by finding the right complex space and then solving a complex function pair equation. Okay, so here, here's, for example, here's a very simple family of uh, already an infinite family of examples, quite simple. So your asymptotic conical six manifold, uh, so the complex, the underlying complex manifold is the canonical line bundle over P1 times P1. So this is just an R2 bundle over S2 times S2. So then you need an asymptotic conical uh, Calabi metric to start with. There's a two parameter family. So they're parameterized by their Kelly class. So this is two real positive parameters. Essentially tell you the size of these two S2s. Uh, then you need to choose a circle bundle. So that's again, two integer parameters uh, for the uh, first gen class. And then there's these topological constraints that you need to satisfy that actually is going to say that the color class is determined by the integers up to, up to a scale factor. So here are alpha, and then sort of you apply this into the theorem, you get a two parameter family of LCG2 metrics. So one parameter alpha is sort of controlling some size of some sort of compact core of these manifolds, and the epsilon is the size of the circle at infinity. And the theorem really only works when epsilon is much smaller than alpha. Okay, so, so this gives, uh, so I sort of told you kind of some general constructions of cyclic, LC spaces in higher dimensions of cyclic type. And now the rest of my time, I want to try to say how to get to uh, the hedral ones. And for the moment that we can only, uh, we can only do in the G2 case, so, so from now on, I'm going to stick to G2 and everything that I'm going to say from now on is joined with uh, Mark Haskins and Johannes Nostrom. Okay, so, so let's go back to what happens in the four dimensional case. So we had this detour of first constructing sort of a ALE space 
and uh, or befold ALF metric. So we want to do something similar. But now in higher dimensions, maybe or before the ALE is not it's too restrictive. So we want to look for asymptotically conical and ALC space with isolated conical singularities. Okay? And uh, in the four dimensions, one way we got them was by sort of starting with some families of uh, ALC space of cyclic type and then trying to grow this circle. Okay? So, so you could sort of try to, try to uh, apply a similar procedure here. <clears throat> so, so if you try to apply that procedure to an arbitrary, mem I mean, an arbitrary metric obtained by this theorem, well, that's going to fail. So, so these moduli spaces of uh, G2 metrics are non-compact, and we don't really know how to control singularity formations or anything. So, but this particular family here, there's something, uh, well, there's two things that are quite special. So one is that, so there's two parameter, which means that up to scale, there's really only one, it's a one parameter family. Okay, so first, maybe in a one parameter family, okay, things cannot go wrong in too many ways. Uh, but also this metric actually is very, very symmetric. So that's something that's useful. So, <clears throat> so the next theorem describes precisely that in, for this uh, sort of uh, infinitely many, kind of countably many, two parameters family of ALC metric, we can study this limit where the circle grows to infinity. So first of all, <clears throat> there's this two parameter alpha and epsilon, and we can construct ALC G2 matrix of cyclic type for every choice of parameters, uh, two positive real numbers. Uh, the previous theorem described the limit where the ratio epsilon equal alpha was going to zero. Now we want to describe the limits where epsilon equal alpha is going to infinity. And there's two ways of trying to understand the limit using scaling. So one is sort of to fix this uh, size in the interior and let the size of the circle at infinity grow. Okay, and in the limit, uh, we proved there exists an asymptotically conical G2 matrix that uh, appears as a limit on the smooth manifold, as you uh, would uh, hope to be true if everything went the right way. Uh, but otherwise, by scaling, again, you have this family where the circle is growing. You rescale so that the circle is fixed and something bad is happening in the interior. So alpha is going to zero, and you get some ALC metric, perfectly nice and infinity, but in the interior, there's an isolated conical singularity. And uh, again, of course, as you would expect, the tangent cone at infinity for the asymptotical guy matches the tangent cone at the singularity for the conically singular one. And the, um, sort of in this case, the model, so it's a cyclic quotient of a conical, explicit conical metric on a topological cone over S3 times S3. So this was constructed by Robert Bryant and Salomon in 1989. OK, so, so uh, things go as uh, sort of you would have uh, hoped for. And proving this theorem is really uses very strongly this symmetry. So you can reduce in the setting to the system of nonlinear ODEs. You can quite solve explicitly, but you can sort of qualitatively study these ODEs and prove existence of solutions and study their behavior, their qualitative properties. And uh, uh, okay, I mean, we hear what could say. I mean, asymptotically conical G2 metrics, there's really, there were only three examples known before this, and now infinitely many. There's also this interesting fact that the sort of tangent cone at infinity only depends on the sum, where the metrics depend on the pair. So you have different ways of desingularizing the same singularity. And the, con the isolated conical singularity, that's also sort of uh, something interesting. I mean, this isolated conical singularity is quite natural from both in geometry and physics, but there was no example so far of some sort of G2 matrix that has an isolated conical singularity but is otherwise complete, but except for cones, of course. Um, so, 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 okay, but really the focus today is try to use these to sort of uh, get some dihedral once by, by uh, sort of this high dimensional version of this construction by Bicarb Minerva. Okay, so. <coughs> So the idea there then was to uh, sort of start with some, um, so we now have a sort of, uh, sort of ALC space, some fixed circle fiber at infinity, and an isolated singularity 
uh, somewhere in the interior. And we have an asymptotic conical uh, manifold asymptotic to the same cone. So I mean, nothing surprising. You can imagine glue the two together and resolve the singularities by gluing the AC manifold. So that this theorem is saying that you can do this preserving the uh, asymptotic geometry. Let's see geometry. OK, so, um, so again, so this, is, this is not a surprising theorem, but uh, there's still some bit of work to do to prove it. So, uh, so, so first of all, so Spiro Karijanis in 2009 proved a similar desingularization in the compact setting. So you had to start with a compact G2 manifold with an isolated conical singularity, at this point completely apothetical because there's no example, and uh, asymptotic conical G2 matrix and used it to desingularize. So what we had, essentially all the analysis was actually appealing to these results of Joyce that tell you how to start with some G2, approximate G2 metrics and perturb. So what we, what we need to do is under something similar uh, in this non-compact ALC setting. So there's some advantages in working in the non-compact case. For example, in the compact setting, there's some topological obstructions to desingularize that do not appear in the non-compact setting if you're kind of flexible enough on decay rates at infinity. So that's good, but m m most, most of it is that you have to work a bit, work a bit more on the analysis. Uh, so, so on the analysis side, actually, I mean, this ALC is a very simple case of fiber boundary metrics. So there's, there's a whole already package of uh, for working on um, sort of weighted spaces for working on this, on this type of geometries. Uh, but we actually need quite a quite refined thing. So I want to just give an example of one thing that you need to understand. So, so to apply this, this uh, Dominic Joyce deformation, essentially the key linear step that you need to do is solve, uh, solve an equation like this for a two form. And the safe size even just compactly supported. Um, but it's key that you're able to solve this for uh, with the eta in L2. Okay. And uh, okay, so being in L2 means that the eta you want something that is a bit the case a bit faster than minus three. And uh, so you would expect eta to decay a bit faster than minus two. Maybe delta is better here. Uh, but there's obstruction actually to do this. Okay. And uh, there's obstruction because in general when you solve your eta is going to have an asymptotic expansion that looks like uh, sort of tau 1 plus log r tau 2 where tau 1 and tau 2 are sort of harmonic forms on the, on the cross sections of the cone at infinity. Okay? So to have the eta in, uh, with the good decay in LT you actually need to prove that there's no, no log term up here. And you can prove that, but that, then you have to understand quite finely how sort of harmonic forms are related to closed and co-closed forms. And uh, um, so, so, so we need to do uh, a bit of that to do this. OK, but anyway, so modulo, modulo these uh, um, technical points, the, the, the result is as you, as you expect. And, uh, and okay, okay, then let's see how to apply this then. So an obvious way to apply is to reconstruct the family that was existence we already know, this G alpha epsilon, right? So you, you have your ALC space with an isolated conical singularity. We have an AC manifolds, asymptotic and infinity to the same cone. We glue them together, get some ALC space. Um, uh, now in the limit where alpha is very, very small. Okay, so this is nothing new. It's like getting Gibbons Hawking metric from gluing uh, cyclic Cayley space to quotients of top knot, which is a bit ridiculous. But we can use this to get dihedral, uh, dihedral G2, LC G2. And, uh, um, and the reason is this. So, so okay, so look at, we look at the case where both M and N are equal to one. So we had the singularity up here is, uh, uh, was this cone over S3 times S3 divided by now a Z4 subgroup, cyclic subgroup there. Okay, so this gives this ALC uh, cyclic of cyclic type. 
Okay? But now, <clears throat> what's good is that inside the asymmetry group of this conically singular ALC space, there's actually a second Z4 that I'll call Z4 minus. This one is a Z4 plus. Now there's a Z4 minus. And this Z4 minus actually really at infinity acts like this uh, um, kind of dihedral involution that breaks the so-called symmetry. Okay, so you can question by this Z4 minus, and you get some dihedral ALC space, but now there's a conical singularity modeled on this colon divided this Z4 minus. Okay? So now you would need an asymptotic conical G2 manifold asymptotic to the same singularity. Okay? And here we'd have been lucky, and what happens is that the isometry group of the conical metric is actually larger than the isometry group of uh, this ALC metric. And within this larger isometry group, Z4 plus and Z4 minus are actually conjugate. So the singularity model is actually the same as the one we had before. Okay, so we can use exactly the same asymptotic conical metric. It just means that you glue it by a sort of a discrete twist. And, uh, and what you get is a smooth uh, dihedral G2 space. Okay, so, so this is really Again, the moral is exactly as in the four-dimensional LF case. And uh, uh, um, OK, that's it. So, so I guess in the grander scheme of things, then once we have a dihedral ALC space, I guess we now have sort of all the building blocks that we need to start, for example, constructing some compact due to manifolds from um, out of these building blocks, possibly also some compact G2 manifolds with isolated singularities using our conically singular ALC space. Uh, but that, a lot more work needed there. Um, so I'll, uh, I think I'll uh, finish what I wanted to say. Uh, thanks.